Well, congratulations to those in the fine arts. That's very impressive. And congratulations to those of you who've been baptized today. I'd like to suggest that's a line in the sand that you always need to look back to. And if you're really young and you might forget, parents remind those young ones. And I hope that this, this message is special for you today as well. Boy, my heart's beating. Because I have to uh, make a confession after seeing these baptisms. You know, I'm a minister of the gospel. Now, as believers, we're all ministers of the gospel, but I'm actually an official minister of the gospel because I have a card here that actually proves it now. <laughs> it actually gets me free parking in the hospitals and funerals, too. So I didn't even think about that. That's great. But as a minister of the gospel, I'm held to a higher standard. I'm going to be judged at a greater level than those who are not official ministers. And that's not bragging. James 3, verse 1, look it up. There's a few other verses. Pastor Ben, Pastor Bobby, Pastor Rachel, anyone who's official, pastor has greater responsibility. That being said, more than others, I should know what God's call is in my life, and I do. More than others, I should know there's an enemy trying to drag me away from that call, and I do know that. I certainly should know good from bad, right from wrong, righteousness from evil. Those things that God is calling me to, those things that I so much want to do, I don't do them. And those things that I detest, that the enemy is trying to drag me into, and I don't want to go there, those are the things I give into. What a sad quandary I've found myself in. Now I said I was going to give you a confession. And I did. But that wasn't my confession, I'm happy to say. That was a confession of someone who should, more than me, know what God's call is. And more than me, know the difference between good and bad. And more than me, be a minister of the gospel. In fact, the one who made that confession wrote most of the books in the New Testament. His name was Paul, the apostle. Now, you might think, did Paul, this man, really struggle with sin that much? One part of me says, yeah, because it makes me feel a little bit better about myself. <laughs> the other part of me says, really? He wrote much of that book. Wow. We'll discuss that in a little bit more later. But first, I want to take the next few moments to focus on the warfare, the battle that takes place in our minds. Because our minds are frequent battlefields and struggles. One of the most frequent is fear. Now, did you know 95% of the things that we are afraid of never happen? It's only 5% of the fear that is really justified or valid. There's an acronym. You've probably heard it. Fear is false evidence appearing real. So the next time you're actually fearing something, think about it. Is it real? There's a whole fun list of phobias that we could go through. I picked out a few of them. 4% of the world is claustrophobic, fears tiny spaces. 8% of the world fears dogs. It's called cyanophobia. 5% fear spiders, arachnophobia. We're probably familiar with that. Acrophobia, the fear of heights, affects 5% of the world. One-third of the world, aerophobia, the fear of flying. I think there's probably a few in here that have that. Another third, maybe the same third, ophidiophobia, the fear of snakes. Yeah. And then there is aerophobia, the fear of flying snakes. All right, just kidding. <laughs> then there's glossophobia, the fear of public speaking. 98% of the world fears public speaking. Not to be confused with glossolalia, which is the speaking in tongues. Now, 
There's glossolaliophobia, which is the fear of publicly speaking in tongues. <laughs> and actually, it's legitimate because there are people who don't want the gifts of the Spirit because they're afraid of some party. They're going to just start babbling in an unknown language. But uh, that's not how it works, folks. Don't fear the gifts of the Spirit. Here are some other battles that enter our mind. Lust. Boy, that's a tough one. A force producing intense desire for an object or circumstance such as sex, money, and power. Anxiety, worry, overwhelming sense of apprehension or fear by doubting one's capacity to cope with a situation. Doubt, questioning truth, or lack of confidence in someone or something. And certainly there are many more, but I saved my favorite for last. Paranoia. There's an old song that used to say, paranoia will destroy you. And I think it's true. It's the delusions of persecution, unwarranted jealousy, fabricated suspicions, let me tell you a story of how, when this enters your mind, how one of these fabricated stories can take hold and begin to battle, maybe even end up in war. Some years ago, before I was married, my best friend and I wanted to take a trip. So we did. We booked a trip to the third world country. And I won't tell you which one because I don't want to ruin it for you. You might be going there. But we had a bunch of mishaps along the way in the different flights that didn't work out and bumpy roads and all this kind of stuff. And we heard a few things said that you better watch out when you get there because the people are out to get you. They want your money. They don't care if they stab you, kill you. Be careful. Well, after all this shaking up and we got off the final, off the final flight, we boarded this big green bus. My friend and I walked onto the bus. All of a sudden, the door slammed behind us. And we were the only passengers. And I looked, and I saw the guy driving the bus. He was the leader of the gang. I knew exactly what was going on. We were going to be taken off into the jungle. We we're going to be beat up, robbed, and left to die. There was another guy in the front row. He was one gang member. And all the way in the back was another one. So we decided to sit right in the very center of the bus. The bus takes off. It's herky-jerky. It's making a left turn, right turn. It's going up. It's going down. It's just going forever like this, all into the darkness. It finally makes it up this big, long hill, and the bus is just jerking and struggling, just like if you got on a roller coaster in that first hill, and you're just feeling bum, 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 and you're waiting to get over the top, and all of a sudden, bang, my seat fell off. I was laying on the back row, or the, or the, the row right behind me, flat on my back. I levitated off the floor, <laughs> rotated in midair, landed like a cat. The guy in the front seat was slumped over, totally asleep. I turned like a ninja to the other guy in the back who was reading a book, and then back to the gang leader who was just looking straight ahead, driving the bus, beating to the sound of his music headsets. Even my friend was totally asleep. I reached down, I picked up a nut and a bolt, put the seat back up, put the bolt back in that had rattled loose, and I'm just glad nobody saw my embarrassment. I had believed a lie of what those people had told me and manufactured this whole scenario it could have turned, turned out really bad, but it didn't. Using the analogy of war, we fill our minds with the wrong ammunition. Things like doubt, fear, and paranoia. And then we have these internal explosions, and we may even shoot out projectiles. We lose confidence in ourselves, in others, and in God. We have acts of gossip that destroy reputations and relationships. Anxiety turns into panic that invokes unrealistic precautions and stress. We become, we become unable to trust anyone if allowed to develop this too far. So what's the proper ammunition that we should load in our head? Well, God's word tells us this in Philippians 8. Whatever is true, whatever is honor, Whatever is just or right, whatever is pure or righteous or holy, 
whatever is lovely or of beauty, whatever is commendable or uplifting, motivational or inspiring, if there is any excellence or things well done, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. There's another acronym that you've probably heard before. It's the THINK acronym. It stands for, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? When you run into these issues with thoughts in your head that are going to turn into a battle, think, is it true? And if it's not, discard. Is it helpful? Is it helpful to me? Is it helpful to the person I'm thinking about? If it's not, discard it. Is it inspiring? Does it cause me to go do and think other good things or other people to do good things? If not, discard it. Is it necessary? Do I really need to be thinking about this? That's one of the simplest things. Do I really need to be thinking about this? And again, don't need to think about it, don't think about it. And is it kind? You know the best way to defeat the enemy in our mind? Never let the battle begin. Here's an example of how an unrestrained thought escalates into the battle and soon thereafter into war casualties. I'm sure you're all familiar with an author named Edgar Allan Poe. Now it's pretty strange that someone of that character could actually give us a spiritual lesson, but it happens. If you've ever read or heard the story of the telltale heart. Now, the book version is much different than the, the movie version. There's all kinds of different scenarios of the movie version. But I'm going to try to stick with the book version here. Here's the story. There is an elderly couple living in this beautiful Victorian mansion. The lady dies. The butler, I'll call him, is a caregiver to the man who is still surviving, the widower. The man happens to have a blind eye. And he goes through this routine day after day after day. The butler wakes him up in the morning, sits with him at the table, eats this boring gruel every morning as the man just stares at him with this blind eye. Later in the day, he takes him through another ritual of reading him a story. At night, he, lets, he sets him in front of the phonograph, plays a record, and later dresses him, puts him to bed. All while this man just stares at him with his glassy stare. Day after day, he gets to the point where he's frustrated and something's driving him crazy. And he realizes it's that hideous eye. I can't take it anymore. But the only way he can stop it is to kill the man. One day he decides to do that. And the line that stuck with me, once conceived, this thought haunted me day and night. It's all he could think about. Then he heard the man's heart beating louder and louder. He thought the neighbors could hear it. He had to stop it, and he killed the man. Buried him under the floorboards. The police come to investigate later on because they heard someone reported a scream. Oh, no. The man has just gone away for a few weeks. As they're talking to the police, the man starts to hear the heart beating from the floorboards. And it gets louder and louder. And the police are just having a good old time telling jokes and stories. And he's taking it that they're making fun of him. And finally he yells out, okay, I did it. I buried him under the floor. When in fact nobody knew anything to the surprise of the police. It was true. All that was manufactured in this man's mind. Once that thought was conceived, it develops and gives birth to a full-blown battle. I put it this way. We give the enemy permission to attack us. Listen to Paul's response here in Corinthians 10, 3, 5. It's metaphoric. He uses, he's, a, he's a master of metaphor. And he uses this metaphoric terminology of warfare. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, 
They have divine power to demolish strongholds. We destroy arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought. Well, how do you do that? We recondition our preconditions. My old pastor, Bert Evans, many years ago, in his 80s, still teaching classes, he would say, periodically when I'm struggling with sin, sometimes I just have to take myself by the collar and shake myself and say, I'm going to make me mind me. Sometimes you have to just do something. You know, we can pray about it and sit back and drink coffee and wait for God to fix it in our life and wait for a long time. Because sanctification doesn't work that way. It's a partnership. God convicts us. We pray about it. He shows us what to do. We take the first step. He walks with us. I have four points here. First, replace patterns with prayer. Romans 12. Offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to, this, to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Two, we replace negative thoughts with positive thanksgiving. And we've read this numerous times before. We're going to read it again. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is love, whatever is of good report, if there is any excellence or anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And this is very important. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul speaking, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Find somebody who models those traits. follow their example. It's called a mentor. Three, replace fear with faith. First John 4, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. We need to say it, repeat it, and understand it. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. But let's change that to he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. Say it with me. He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. Get that in your spirit. Number four, replace doubt with delight. Having the confidence of a child with an almighty father. When we were kids, we used to argue about whose dad was the strongest. My dad can pick up that lawnmower with one hand. Well, my dad can pick up that car. Oh, yeah, well, my dad can beat up your dad. Oh, yeah? Well, let's see. We'd wait for him to come home. They'd get out of the cars, walk across the yard, shake hands. Hey, how'd you do today? Walk back and just friends. It's not like we were disappointed, but we still always thought our dad could beat up the other dad. I began today with this confession of Paul. And I want to read just a portion of what Paul, what Paul wrote word for word. And it's from Romans 7, 14 through 24. We're going to start right around 23. So I find this law at work. In fact, I'm going to read it through the, in the Bible here. I've got a little bit different version that's on the screen. But I'm going to go back a little further. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law, God the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? 
Scholars debate this passage. Some say that it was a true struggle that Paul was having in his spirit. Others say that because of the Greek influence, Paul was giving a dramatic interpretation of the battle that rages within those who have no hope. I believe Paul did struggle with sin like we all do. But I take it, I take this as a dramatic, emphasized presentation. So to my earlier question, must it really be that way? The war within might be normal for people without Christ, but it should never be accepted as normal to believers. Don't ever give in to the idea that you cannot overcome sin because if you walk daily with God, you're led by his spirit. Then the answer is no. It need not be that way. Because Paul finishes his dissertation by saying this in verse 25. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. And goes on to say, in all things we 